Hello and welcome to Season 2 of Your Art Sucks, a podcast that continues to fight against mediocrity in all forms of art. And this is Episode 1, Deep Oppression, Naji Alali and Kuzanai Churai. In this episode, we will examine the impact of government oppression and the artists who've risked their lives to rally against this injustice. Hopefully, at the end of this show, we will find some methods or practices we can incorporate into our artistic processes. Now, before we get to the content, I just want to take a second and thank you for listening. Your feedback and downloads have inspired me, and I'm very happy to be able to continue this series in an effort to bring you more interesting content that you will find value in. As I am recording this show, Your Art Sucks currently sits at number two in the podcast charts for the arts division. I'm completely blown away by that, so just want to say thank you to everybody who's listening, and I hope that um, getting more visibility in the iTunes store will definitely... um, Uh, increase, you know, more downloads, but also, you know, get more of a discussion going, getting more comments and just getting more artists involved in the podcast, I think would be a great thing. So again, thank you to everyone listening. um, And I hope it continues. You know, I really enjoy doing this. And I really enjoy the fact that there's uh, people out there who are getting something from these podcasts, because that was my that was my goal from the outset. So hopefully that's still working. And and this episode will provide you with with some uh, interesting information as well. So let's begin. As I began to research ideas for for new episodes, uh, I came across numerous articles that highlighted countries where art and artists were considered enemies of the state. Now, I was aware that heads of countries throughout history had come to treat writers and other creative types as potential threats to their dominance. They took great steps to silence them at any hint of perceived impropriety. I kind of ignorantly believed that such crimes were lessened due to the rise of the internet and the ability of governments to be attacked from dissidents both outside and in. I truly felt that the anonymity that the internet could provide would allow artists to be an unstoppable force against any form of forced oppression. Sadly, as I would come to find out, I was mistaken. While this episode will highlight previous cases of oppression, I did want to mention that there are artists in countries around the world who are facing prison sentences, banishment, or even death from producing their art as I speak. We can currently see this in artists like Ai Weiwei or even Pussy Riot in Russia. They've been jailed numerous times, they've been threatened, but they continue to practice their art in spite of such oppression. Now, if you're interested in understanding the plight of these victims, or, you know, if you want to take steps to help your peers or help other artists, I would urge you to visit Amnesty International. They have uh, on their website, they have current campaigns they're running, and hopefully you can add some visibility to to their campaigns and and maybe get some, some of these injustices corrected. If we look at the profession of journalism, we can see that writers are by far the most targeted group of artists by government. In Mexico, as of 2016, over 104 journalists have been murdered by government forces or those who seek to control power in these regions. This number rises further if we count the 25 other writers who have disappeared and who are now considered deceased. Second in Mexico are other countries like India and Afghanistan, where such a profession can easily get you killed just for asking the wrong questions. And as of this week, with the unrest we're seeing in Nicaragua, journalists like Angel Gohanna continue to be murdered. These instances are complete tragedies. But the startling fact is, is even in spite of such dangers and such risks, so many artists are willing to continue to take up the fight against such deep oppression. Countless people risk their lives each day to use their art to bring about change and end the corruption that had a hand in the murder of their colleagues. While one can understand how a well-researched article or critical essay could spark an anti-government movement, Would you believe that a series of cartoons actually became a call to the oppressed to rise against their government? To answer that, let's have a look at political cartoonist Naji El Ali. Born in roughly 1938 in the northern Palestinian village of Al Shajara, Naji lived in exile with his family in Lebanon after the 1948 Palestinian exodus in which over 700,000 people had to leave their Palestinian homes and villages. 
After settling in Seda, about 40 kilometers south of Beirut, Naji completed school and went to vocational school in Tripoli. Now moving again, this time to Beirut, Naji lived in a refugee camp where he worked odd jobs until he qualified as a car mechanic in 1957. This allowed him to move to Saudi Arabia, where he worked until 1959. It was at this time that he felt a very strong call to return to Lebanon. And once there, he joined the ANM, the Arab Nationalist Movement. The ANM's approach meant an uncompromising hostility towards Western imperialism in a general sense, and in a specific sense, it targeted Israel. The movement itself led to the formation of the anti-Zionist doctrine. But Naji was dismissed four times in one year from the movement due to his lack of party discipline. Naji would continue to work with some of his brothers from the ANM, and in between 1960 and 1961, they would create a handwritten political journal called al Sarka. It's also during this time that he would first learn that his work would have some ramifications. During his studies at the Lebanese Academy of Fine Arts, he was in prison for political reasons. His cartoons, though, would not be stopped due to his imprisonment. Ghassan Kanafani came across these cartoons, and he reprinted them in another political journal called al Hurya. It was in num- uh, edition number 88 in September of 1961. Now Naji, once released, would continue to travel and work for newspaper publications, which had him returning to Lebanon many times throughout the years, each visit seeming longer and longer in duration. His final employer, Kuwait paper al Kabas, had him relocated to London in 1985. And it was here, sadly, we would have his life cut short just two years later. The reason for this is solely blamed on one of his cartoon characters, a 10-year-old refugee named Handala. Before we get to Handala, let's get some perspective on Naji's work. He was a prolific cartoonist with over 40,000 completed to his credit. Now, that's, that's just absolutely insane, in my opinion, to, to have 40,000 images you created in such a short time. It really underscores his dedication to the craft and to his beliefs. Most of these images depicted the suffering and resistance of Palestinian people, while being very harshly critical of the state of Israel, as well as Palestinian leaders themselves. His works did not depict actual leaders, but was focused on the lack of resettlement by Palestinians forced from their former lands. This was a topic that Naji was very familiar with as he had experienced exile firsthand, and throughout his life he continued wandering as a person who felt like he had no home. So let's circle back to Handala. It is this character that became famous in many Arab countries, and had the most impact of all of Naji's work. Handala is a simply drawn figure. He's barefoot, clothed in rags, and with small strands of hair that poke kind of out of his round head. For the most part, the character is turned away from the viewer with his hands clasped behind his back. A gesture, Naji says, is suggestive of the character's rejection of any outside solutions for Palestinian issues. In little time, Handala became the signature of Naji's cartoons and remains an iconic symbol of Palestinian identity and defiance. Handala has also been used as the web mascot of the Iranian Green Movement. The artist remarked that he was the arrow of the compass, pointing steadily towards Palestine. Not just Palestine in geographical terms, but Palestine in its humanitarian sense. The symbol of just cause, whether it is located in Egypt, Vietnam, or South Africa. Now, while Handela was seen as hope and justice, it was also seen by some as a symbol of those who would rise against governments and use violence to get their message across of their suffering. Put it plainly, Naji was the creator of a symbol that united activists and that's something that had to come to an end. It was on July 22nd of 1987 when Naji was shot in the right temple by a then unknown assassin right out front of the al newspaper in London. While he managed to survive on life support for several weeks, he would succumb to his injury in August. British police would eventually arrest Ismail Sawan, a 28-year-old Jerusalem-born Palestinian researcher from Hull University. And in his possession, they found a cache of weapons 
that they said were intended for use in terrorist attacks around Europe. He was only charged with possessions of weapons and explosives. Initially, police said Sawan was a member of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, though they denied any involvement. Further to this, it was revealed that Sawan was also a double agent for the Israeli Mossad. As the Mossad knew of the hit, but didn't inform the British police, then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who was furious over the killing, she expelled three Israeli diplomats and closed Mossad's London base in retaliation. There are some that say Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat was behind the assassination, but there's no conclusive proof as to who called for Naji's death. All that is known is that his political satire was too much for those in power, and for that he paid the ultimate price. In Naji's story, we see the impact a drawing can have on the politics of a nation. As simple as some of us may believe these cartoons are when compared to works from the great masters, these artworks resonated with the masses in a way most art can't. They're extremely well thought out and crafted in a way that the message is clear and understood by those who might see it regardless of their societal structure or economic condition. To further prove the power of a single image, I would like to talk next about South African artist and activist Kuzunai Chiurai. Born near the capital of Zimbabwe in 1981, Kuzanai would go on to spend the majority of his life in South Africa, where he would become the first black student to graduate with a bachelor's degree in fine art from the University of Pretoria. Originally a landscape painter, his interest in the political climate of his country became of more interest to him to the point where he decided that his artistry would be put to better use to highlight the injustices he saw on a daily basis in Zimbabwe. From 2002 to 2005, he produced politically inspired work that charactered President Robert Mugabe and his oppressive regime, the ZANU Patriotic Front, which led to his being banned from his home country and receiving multiple death threats. In a 2005 interview about his first solo exhibition, this was in Johannesburg, Chiurai said, I might sound brave, but I am very disturbed. I am very concerned about my family. I am torn apart. You see, my mother still lives in Zimbabwe. I also love the country, and I want to go back. It's been three years since my last visit. The country is in my bloodstream. Now, to better understand how dangerous this act of activism against Robert Mugabe was, let's look at the future dictator. You see, at first, Mugabe had intentions that helped him stay aligned with the Western world. He was interested in bringing democracy to Zimbabwe, as he, too, understood what it was like to be in prison and exiled for his political views. But these worldly views quickly spiraled out of control as Mugabe seized power using political force with his ZANU party. There are humanitarian claims against Mugabe that his party played a part in the death of over 20,000 civilians over five years. Now, this was done to ensure that he smashed all elements of dissonance and solidified his power. Mugabe would eventually take control of the Zimbabwe government and set himself up as dictator. He continued to dispose of anyone who would oppose him, as well as launching strikes against any white landowners in the region. His self-serving tactics led to a massive crisis for the people of the country. But to most, his reign was not to be questioned, and he was to be their leader. Kuzanai, unlike most, decided that this was not to be the case, and he began to create images that called out Mugabe, so much so that one of Kuzanai's descriptions of Mugabe became a symbol of political change in that country. In the lead-up to the 2008 elections, Kuzanai painted Robert Mugabe surrounded by flames and with horns growing out of his head. Kuzanai would adopt the street style of artist Banksy, who's famous for spray-painting his political and social graffiti throughout the world, and stencil his image of Mugabe on the walls around Zimbabwe. Kuzanai says this of his one depiction. Art has always played an important role in telling people's stories, whether it's through painting or posters, whether it mirrors a thought or it mirrors an idea, whether it mirrors a conversation that has to be had. I thought that, in that instance, it was possible to do all of this in one image. 
Kudz and I would also use his platform to expose the xenophobic undercurrent in his country that would lead to so many people being too fearful to vote in this election. But with a strong belief that every person should have a voice, Kuz and I had no apprehension of filling the role of activist. He says this, he says, with every generation, you always want to be the generation that contributed something. I always say, if there's a vacancy in history, you should apply for it. So for me, it was that. The poster boy thing sort of came as a result of that. But then for me, it was like I wanted to do something. I thought it was very important. Unfortunately, it did not stop the re-election of Mugabe. Kuzunai had to flee his country without the change he so desired. Fortunately for the world, though, he continues to work as an activist to this day. He also continues to draw ire for the work that exposes the many injustices that still exist in South Africa. He's received much acclaim for his work and his dedication to the people of his beloved Zimbabwe. Now we come to the point of the show where we look at how these artists can shape our own creative efforts. And while there was much sacrifice in this episode, with Najee losing his life to an act of international assassination, and Kudzanai being forced from his homeland by a corrupt dictatorship, we can see that both of these artists exemplified a multitude of traits and personal dedication to a craft that produced art solely focused on the betterment of others. This is a truly noble effort and one we should never take lightly. A career spent making the world for some or all better is a life well spent, to be sure. But what if the idea of activism is one that you find unappealing? What if you're the type of person who refuses to use your well-defined platform to push an ideology that would only drive a portion of your audience away? Or what if you've never found anything in your life that you would be willing to take a serious stand on? Well, I would say that you may need to review the purpose of your art. As anyone who produces work, be it a performance, a screenplay, a sculpture, it must, at its core, have a message that allows the viewer to find themselves reflected in it. I've mentioned many times on previous episodes, and I believe it to be one of the essential truths of successful art. So please listen up, because I'm about to say it again. Art that lacks a message however overt or subtle, is doomed to be vacuous and lend itself to misinterpretation or relegation. Time and time again we see artists come and go in a flash. Their work holds no lasting value outside of the short-term gain that may land them some ounce of recognition. They are, in reality, the one-hit wonders of the art world. So at all costs, please avoid creating empty art. Now, outside of the essential integral messaging, what else can Naji and Kuzanai teach us? Well, another very important lesson for all of us to take away is the ability to create work that is not overly complicated. In both of their cases, these artists created cartoons or depictions that spoke loudly to the masses with simple line drawings. It's vital to remember that work that seeks to be overly self-indulgent let's think of thickly worded novels, for instance, doesn't bestow a level of validity or intelligence on the artist. If you are unaware, please take a look at artists like Paul Klee or Cy Twombly, for instance. They have very simple paintings and, and, and pictures that harken back to a more childlike execution. Or look to the works of Hemingway to see sentences that are stripped of all pretense but work perfectly to convey emotion and character progression. Now, don't fool yourself, though. Simplicity is far from simple. The reality is, is that it takes years of experience to complete effectively. Very few have the ability to constantly review their work and strip away the weakest elements, all the while not detracting from the originating impetus. Even fewer people come to gain any level of success due to the many factors that inhibit their growth, with the largest being the egoic need to have your peers' acceptance. For example, having worked in restaurants for far too many years to say, I can always spot a chef who is inexperienced or has a big ego. 
Their food always has far too many elements or uses ingredients for the sake of foodie recognition and not for taste. They fail to allow their talent to speak for itself in its most earnest and honest form. So let's wrap this up by having you take away two things. The first being the importance of having your work or performance or project be one that contains an essential truth. These themes can be justice or love or peace or anger or fear. Whatever it is, ensure that the message is present. Regardless of the level of activism, subtle or overt, your message has to resonate with the viewer. The second point being to keep your work from becoming bloated or overworked for the sake of your ego. More is never better. If anything, remember this. Simple is sublime and truth resonates. Well, now we come to the end of this episode, and I hope that you found it inspirational. I know that was a bit tragic. Uh, we, we did see some people lose their lives and, and lose their homes, but let's try to just take what we can from these instances to better our art. Let's respect the fact that there are artists that have sacrificed so much for the sake of so many. Now, I'm very excited to be continuing this podcast and I'm even more excited that more people are listening. I would love nothing more than to have each of you tell somebody about this show. I know that together we can help rid the world of shitty art. But with the mountain of garbage that stands in our way, I need everyone going on the website and, and, and rating in iTunes or just commenting and reviewing if you would be so kind. Every effort helps push me further up into the charts, like number two lately. So again, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Now, stop listening to me and go protest something.